Hi guys, my name is Yannick, and I'm originally from Montreal. I'm super excited about having PyCon there uh, next year. What about you guys? Great. So uh, today I want to talk to you about the caching infrastructure that we have at Facebook and how we use Python to uh, manage the scale. Um, my plan is to talk to you about first why we need uh, caching, and then we're going to go through an overview of both memcache and tau, the two key parts of our infrastructure. So first of all, I probably need to clarify what I mean by cache. Because I'm not uh, referring to the level 1, level 2 cache on your CPU. I'm not talking about the block cache on your hard drives or the query cache on your databases. I'm talking about a globally distributed, uh, non-persistent data store that can answer queries within one millisecond. Why one millisecond? Why not five? Why not 10? Uh, the main reason is that the highly dynamic and personalized experience uh, on Facebook generates a lot of data dependency. The graph that you see here is uh, the subsequent data fetches that we need to perform in order to render one news feed story. Think about uh, retrieving the name of the author, his latest profile picture, the content of the story, the likes, the comments on that story, your relationship with these people who are liking and commenting on the story. So if we're going to do that many data fetches to render one news feed story, and we aim to render the full news feed in a reasonable amount of time, then that's where we get that hard requirement of answering most of these within one millisecond. Let's talk about memcache. We use memcache at Facebook uh, roughly the same way as most of you probably do as a look aside on-demand field cache. So when we need a piece of data, we look to see if it's in memcache. Uh, if it's not, we go to the data store. Sometimes it's the database. Sometimes it's an expensive computation. Then we put it back in the cache, and then subsequent uh, request for that element of data can be answered uh, with our requirement of one millisecond. We want to have a fairly large address space, and that's why we use many servers in our cache pools. And we use consistent hashing to spread the load over all of these servers. That's a widely accepted way of doing it. And I'm not going to cover that, but I encourage you to look it up because this is a very powerful technique. We have a problem uh, if we want to maintain that, the, that globally distributed system and to keep answering the, qu the queries within one millisecond. Because crossing the Atlantic, as an example, is two orders of magnitude slower than one millisecond. Um, so that means that we have one hard requirement, is that the consistency of the caching system is going to be eventual. We cannot maintain strong uh, instantaneous consistency. We replicate uh, data. Uh, we keep the consistency of the caching system by leveraging the MySQL replication. All the writes are sent to master regions. And the database replication uh, brings the data into slave regions in slave regions, we have a daemon called Aqueduct that is listening to the MySQL replication log, and that's going to send invalidation messages to all the local uh, cache machines in the slave region. It's inter interesting to note at this point that we send invalidations rather than filling the new values. And the main reason for that is that we can reorder invalidations. We can spool them. We can um, replay them if we're recovering from an outage. In terms of numbers, we're talking about thousands of servers. Uh, our memcache deployment answers over a billion cache operations per second. Uh, we have over a trillion key value associations. And we segment the memory space into multiple pools. And I'm not going to cover that, but I want to highlight that the vast majority of the data that we need to run the site comes straight from memory. We still need MySQL, but mostly as a persistent storage, uh, not as a live, uh, as the as source of the live data. So how do we use uh, Python to uh, manage the scale? Um, we use Python in multiple places in the Facebook infrastructure, in for managing memcache in particular. And I'm just going to cover two use cases here. 
Uh, one is mcconf. mcconf is the tool that we use to manage the pools, to create them, grow them. And we want to use Python here because we want a shorter uh, development cycle. Memcache is like very low level, C daemon with very efficient memory allocation, very fast network transactions. It has a fairly slow uh, release cycle. So we want to be able to have a tool that's going to have a short release cycle because we want to keep track of the changing requirements of the site based on the growth, on the new regions that we're turning up, on the new features that developers are implementing. The other thing is that in order, as an example, to replace a server in the pool, we have to uh, query and update half a dozen services internally. And Python is really good, as you've listened, uh, as you've Sorry, as you've learned in other talks, at uh, being the glue language between multiple services. The other problem that we solve with Python is the one of software upgrades. Memcache is very stateful. Uh, if we, when we have a new version of Memcache, we cannot just deploy it on all the servers and restart the daemon. That would invalidate all the cache, and the website cannot run on a fully cold cache. <laughs> so. Uh, we solve this problem by uh, using Python. So the way we do that, uh, we are going to upgrade one machine, then have a Python uh, daemon monitoring the state of this machine to see how fast it's warming its cache. Uh, then we're going to monitor one level higher at the regional pool level to see what's the, the impact on the hit rate of, th of that pool. And we're going to change the rate of the upgrade uh, depending on the load of the site and uh, what's the impact of upgrading the machines on the various pools. We can roll some of these pools in parallel. And we love to use Python here, because the strategy that we are going to use to roll these pools in parallel and the rate that we're going to use uh, is a lot more of an art than a science. And by using Python, um, we're able to learn a lot by experimenting with various strategies. Let's look at the problem from a different angle. <laughs> we represent data at Facebook uh, using graph semantics. Um, users and posts and comments uh, are represented as nodes, type nodes. And the relationships between all of these, friendship and liking, uh, are represented as typed edges. If we are to tell our caching system about this graph semantic, then we can get the caching system to perform very powerful query queries that go way beyond a simple key value lookup. That system uh, that we developed internally is called Tau. Tau does many things, and for now, I just want you to remember that Tau is a read-through and write-through cache. And that means that if we're looking for a piece of content, we are going to ask Tau. If Tau doesn't have it in its cache, it's going to be responsible for uh, retrieving that data from the database. Similarly, when we write a new value in the social graph, we send it to Tau, and Tau is responsible for delivering that new information to the database. Uh, in terms of numbers, Tau is, uh, as a deployment, fairly similar to Memcache. It's a bit uh, higher in terms of number, but not significantly. So we're also talking about thousands of machines, over a billion cache operations per second. And here again, the vast majority of the social graph is served straight from memory without accessing the databases. We use Python for Tau in ways fairly similar to what we do for Memcache, but there's a few interesting uh, usages that I want to cover with you. On November 6th of last year, uh, I was having a beer at my place, very good American pale ale, and I was chatting with a friend of mine from Montreal, and she was asking, oh, are you excited about the elections? As a Canadian, my answer was, well, you know, I don't have the right to vote, uh, so I try not to get too excited about things that I cannot influence. And, and I'm sure some of the Canadians in the room can, can relate to that. 
And then somebody posted that picture. This picture is remarkable because of this number here, 4 million likes. <laughs> About half of these were performed within the first few hours of the picture coming online. Um, and I was on call that night, and I got paged. <laughs> <laughs> and remember that Tao is responsible for performing rights. Uh, you should also know that we spread the load of, of in our Tao pools by using consistent hashing. So it means that in every region, there was one machine that was selected to handle all of these rights. <laughs> um, that, that's not the full story. We have an extension to consistent hashing. And for some hot shards that we're going to mark as uh, shards with high load, uh, we have an extension that's going to tell the consistent hashing function to say, rather than saying, this is one machine that you should contact, this is going to say this is a set of machines that you should contact. The service that was responsible for marking shards as hot uh, was written in Python. And fortunately, uh, so in that case, it didn't kick in fast enough. It was a bit too conservative. Uh, but the great thing about Python is that we were able to use that newly gained knowledge to improve that service. And now we have a two-level uh, load balancing algorithm for our hot shards that is going to mark shard as hot. And we have a global lookup table that's going to pin these shards to cold machines. So rather than simply spreading the load across multiple machines, we specifically select machines that are under low load, and we assign them these hot shards. We use Python to do that. Uh, one reason is that uh, we can leverage uh, network protocol, network uh, paradigms like G-Event to be able to probe thousands of machines and get their, their health metrics, see which ones are hot, which ones are cold, select the hot shards that are prime target. And we do that several times a day. And, and this is working great. I, I didn't get paged for uh, a hot image yet. We'll see you uh, during the next election. <laughs> the other thing that I want to cover, and uh, how are we doing on time? Um, got two more minutes. Good. So the other thing that I want to cover briefly <laughs> is uh, that we use Python for um, schema validation of our configuration. So we have many data sources uh, to be able to, to generate these config files that contain the mapping of all the caching servers. And we need to distribute these to all the cache clients. That means all the web servers, we have thousands of them, and other uh, machines that we have that will access the cache. And there was this one time that where we invalidated a significant chunk of the cache. Uh, because one of these data source is serialized PHP arrays. So for those of you who don't know, PHP arrays are sometimes, something like a, a mix between Python lists and Python dictionaries. You can use them as an ordered sequence, or you can use them as an associative array. Python dictionaries, as you know, uh, do not guarantee the order of the keys. So, so there was this one time where we fed from one data source that was a PHP array, and we had to convert it into Python. So we have two choices. We are going to either convert it to, into an array or to convert it into a dictionary. And it got converted uh, by using automatic typecasting into a dictionary, and that reshuffled a bunch of, uh, of cache machines into the consistent hashing. That was a bit of a disaster, but fortunately, <laughs> <laughs> fortunately, we're using Python to validate our config files. Uh, both in terms of schema and with business logic. And that means that we were able to add business rules to avoid problems like that in the future. This is all what I'm going to cover. These are also tools that we use that are written in Python. Uh, but if you want to learn more about, uh, let's say, how we perform failover, if you want to learn more about numbers, or how we ensure that we maintain the read after write semantic, I invite you to uh, check these two papers that we've got accepted in uh, USENIC uh, conferences recently. Thank you a lot.
this. Have you ever heard of collections.orderdict? <laughs> so so, so the, the problem was not, um, I, I guess the order dict would have been a, a, an interesting way to, to solve that. Uh, I, I don't think we would like to convert all PHP arrays automatically to order dicks. There, there's a bit of overhead to do that. Uh, we're talking about thousands of entries uh, in fairly large config files already. Uh, but that, that would be an interesting way to solve that problem for good. I couldn't help but thinking, when you showed the picture of uh, Obama, had the four million likes, presumably those were coming in from all over the world. Um, what strategy did you use to make sure that um, that total was, I like, uh, I'm just thinking of all the sinking of all the local caches of all those likes to actually get the correct number at the end? Yeah, so, so uh, that, that's, a, that's a valid question. And it's fairly likely that in the heat of the moment, that number was off by a few thousand for any given individual. It, it takes a few seconds for the MySQL replication to propagate. And, and in most cases, we are fortunate enough that these numbers don't need to be exactly accurate. Like, if you're going to look at that picture, the emotion that you feel when you see <laughs> one million like is not going to be much different if it's one million and one thousand. <laughs> Have you investigated other caching solution that use like write true as part of them, like Redis or other things like that? So I have not myself. I, I know that the other engineers working on the caching system have, and I can't recall what their conclusion was. Uh, it, it's fairly safe to say that the solution that we have uh, involves pushing a lot of the logic on the client side, which would be a, an overhead for somebody starting from scratch but that allows us to control the scaling of our infrastructure very well. Uh, and that, in, that uh, let me give you an example. Since we have a lot of logic on the client side, we can instrument that logic and get a lot of insight on uh, usage pattern for different key families and things like that. And, and that helps us a lot to do better allocation of our cash pool into key families with similar access patterns which we would not get with a, a system like Redis. Hi. Uh, you talked about eventual consistency. And right. for like a site like Facebook, there's a lot of additive data. Like, I add a photo, I add a comment. And that can be eventually consistent for other people. But there are other actions where I, uh, uh, you'd hope that when you do them, it's right away. Like, let's say I delete a message, mm -hmm. or I change my privacy settings. And if I delete a message, I don't want somebody who maybe a second later goes to the site would see it, right? Do you handle that specially, or um, are there ways or things like that? So uh, basically, yes, there, there is this latency that can take up to a second or two, and, and there's not many things that we can do around it. Thank you, Yannick. Uh, please applaud Yannick. Yeah.